Today on the Grave Talks, Dark Side of the Dead, a conversation with Connie Lefebvre. At the age of five, Connie Lefebvre had her first encounter with the paranormal. The experience would only be the beginning of a life that would lead her into helping those affected by the paranormal. From possessions to ghostly animals, Connie's had experiences that some would find hard to believe. However, these events are all too real. Today, we hear her story on The Grave Talks. You know, it's amazing that you say that because it is really true about most of us in the paranormal. We all have a starting place. We all have a starting point. And for me, it was a childhood. And I really didn't like pay attention to it that much until I was later. Mm-hmm. But I was at the I was I was five years old when it first happened to me. Mm-hmm. And people don't go looking for these things to happen. It just kind of happens to you. Sure. And that's what like gets you going. But um, I was living with my grandmother, my great grandmother. This is before I was adopted and I was living in a very poor house. And so when I, as I was growing up, I was sleeping with my sister and my grandmother in a really, really big bed in a room. Mm-hmm. So we all kind of just slept together and kind of huddled together on the bed. And the bed was up against the wall. And I would always sleep close to the wall. And I have this thing where I like to, I used to like to lay on my stomach and stick my hand in between the wall and the bed. Mm-hmm. So like, that's the way I always slept. And I was doing that that night. I was sleeping on my stomach and I woke up and I turned and I, and I, and I uh, maneuvered my hand down in between the wall and the, the bed, like I always do. And I'm wide awake. And so it couldn't have been me daydreaming or just, you know, dreaming it up, but something grabbed me. <sighs> And it was, it was my hand that it grabbed my arm, my wrist area. Mm-hmm. And it was cold. And I was like, oh, this must be a joke. You know, I'm, I was only five, though. Uh, but at a, as a five-year-old, you know, you scream. You don't think this is a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, you think that later. Um, at the time, I was just like, what? And it started tugging on my hand. And I could feel the fingernails. I mean, I could feel the details of, yeah. of, of this encounter, which is why it's so weird. Um, because normally you don't feel something like that. It's, it was like a hand grabbing me and it was cold. Yeah. And so it grabbed me and then it clutched on. And then I felt my head banging up against the wall as it was trying to pull me through. I was like screaming at the top of my lungs as something's trying to drag me through the wall. Mm-hmm. And it couldn't have been anybody under the bed because the bed was one of those box beds, you know, where it's filled up and there's nothing underneath. Yeah. This is back in, you know, 78, 76 mm-hmm. and, uh, in Abilene, Texas is where I was at. And I, I, I was tr- getting pulled to the, the stupid wall and I'm screaming bloody murder. And I finally break free from the grip. And I, it was such a hard break that I flipped over on top of my sister and my grandmother. It, it lasted for maybe a good 10 seconds. And, you know, they were waking up as I was screaming. Mm-hmm. But it, this thing had a hold of me the whole time. As I'm as I'm trying to break free, and I was only five, so like, I, you can imagine the trauma afterwards. The rest of the night, I was, I think I peed the bed that night. Sure, I'm pretty sure that I did not want to sleep on that side of the bed ever again. Yeah, uh, even to this day, I don't like sleeping on on that side of the bed. I just I just have a thing about it, and so that's what got me in in you know to thinking about the paranormal and realizing there was something there when maybe I didn't realize it or pay attention to it before. Mm -hmm. And nothing like that major happened to me again for a really, really long time. But I always had it in the back of my head that I wanted to find out what it was about. Sure. I mean, what what a traumatic thing. It wasn't just a quick, you know, oh, it it feels like maybe something grabbed me. You had an experience where it's tugging at you. It's pulling you into the wall. I mean, it's it's the reason I don't have my arms hanging off the bed at night. (laughs) It's because Yeah, and I'm starting to think that maybe I shouldn't have been doing that in the first place now. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's and it's one of those childhood things where, you know, some people are fine with it and some are not. Some are just I'm going to err on the side of fear and and not do that. That's what I would always do. Uh, But you. Actually, that in the closet monster, yeah. right? Yeah, but you actually yeah. had it happen. So after you 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 break free and and your uh, your, your family members are waking up, how are they responding to you uh, at that point in time? Obviously, trying to calm you down, but how are they responding to to what you're saying just occurred? Well, obviously, they're going to tell you what everybody gets told when they're a kid. And, and they think a monster's under the bed. Mm-hmm. 
Um, go back to sleep. It was just a nightmare. You know, you didn't, you didn't see or feel anything. It didn't really happen to you. Um, but I literally made them get up and check under the bed for me before I wouldn't leave and lay back down. And then I wouldn't lay back on that side of the bed, yeah. but they, they, they tend to calm you, but at the same time, reassure you that nothing really happened mm-hmm. when you know something clearly did. Sure. So I think that's a big um, downfall in the paranormal community is we tend to tell people, Oh, that didn't really happen to you. You didn't really have that experience. You must be out of your mind without even investigating it or looking at it. Mm-hmm. So, but here, here we, here we are as a parent family and we're seeing that, you know, the other side. So they, they were doing, you know, the, the typical, you know, parental and the thing, just let's calm down that this didn't happen. It, it, you know, you're imagining it. It was a dream, this or that. Did, as time progressed, is that the stance that they, they stuck with? Or was there any other things that occurred in that house? Cause that seems like quite a dramatic thing to have happen mm-hmm. with nothing else happening either. Were there other things? Well, I was there for a very short time because I was I was put in foster care shortly after. Okay. So I didn't get to stay in that house, but I can tell you that the house did not feel easy mm-hmm. when I did live there. And um, you know, I didn't have any more paranormal experiences like that. Mm-hmm. But I did feel kind of an uneasy, uneasy heaviness in the house mm-hmm. where I wasn't as comfortable before as I was then. Um, I think a lot of things attach to you when you're at a weakened state, when you're stressed out, when you're when you're weak in your mind. And I think that's what had happened. I think we were at a state where we were at a weakened state and things tend to latch on to you when you're like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we just, I did I, it never happened again at that location. And when I was adopted and put into foster care with my sister, you know, I never went back to that house. Sure. Did your sister ever discuss that with you again, uh, as far as that night and what occurred later? Yes, yes, we 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 have discussed it, and she believes me because she's had things happen to her during her over her lifetime. Hers were later. Okay. Uh, and and I don't know, maybe maybe something followed us around for a while and latched back latched onto her. Um, but you know, we never talked about it that much afterwards. But it has come up in conversation. Like I remember that time when this happened, and she was like, "Oh yeah, I remember that." Mm-hmm. So you know, is things like that that went you know that pop up. So how did life continue to progress for you? I know you said you, you got into to foster care and then had an adoptive family. I mean, tell me what what was life like then? Did, did, did you have other occurrences that happened within childhood? Well, um, I, I'll be honest with you. I was struggling so much, even in my adopted family, just mm-hmm. trying to fit in and, and do what I was supposed to do mm-hmm. that I think, I think uh, those types of things I kind of ignored. Okay. Mostly in my life, like I, I, I might have seen something out of the corner of my eye or heard something, but I just wrote it off to being illogical. I never really put the pieces together until later, you know, when I became an adult and I started seeking these things out uh, literally because I wanted to find answers. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and it never really latched on to me like like that afterwards. So but I, I have had experiences all throughout my life where I've been, I've encountered these things and I just, sometimes I don't know how to react. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I'm so drawn into it that I just have to find out more. Sure. And I think my childhood up to now, I had this like religious journey Mm -hmm. um, and it's just morphed over time. But in the end, I just ended up being, you know, a Protestant non-denominational Christian, but I still want the answers. Sure. And so that's what's led me to seek out the paranormal and, and learn about it. Um, and then in the, in the meantime, we're still having, you know, my husband and I, when we got married, we, we were already ghost hunting mm-hmm. and then we joined uh, a team called after dark and we were there for a while and we had experiences there. And then we joined a taps family team in San Antonio, stayed on that team for a while, moved to South Texas, and then started the graveyard shift paranormal investigations. Um, when we were down in South Texas, we did a lot of exploration for probably, you know, 10 years. Uh, we were down there five years, but we eventually moved, came to San Angelo where I'm from and continued our investigations here. So, so t- we, mm-hmm. so t- tell me about how, obviously you had that very, you know, traumatic experience at the age of five. 
and then you go through uh you know childhood and and trying to find your way there and and navigate all that is uh, childhood uh under some difficult circumstances as you got older was there another moment then at some point whether it be teen years 20 years or something like that where you said you know, I, I do want to take a more serious look at this because uh, obviously that was part of your mind and it was part of your mindset mm-hmm. of being curious. But, you know, to, to take the leap from just I'm curious about this to I want to dive back into I want to dive into that really for the first time, you know, as an adult with far more power than a five year old has. Right. Um, right. You know, w- was there a, a moment where where you decided to do that? Was there an event that occurred that kind of triggered that or was it just kind and, of a decision? And I'm going to be honest with you. I was a late bloomer. My experiences started much later in life. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's weird that, that I would have that big of a gap from childhood to now. I'm 50 now. Mm-hmm. And my journey began probably when I was about 36 okay. or so. So, like, I, I had that traumatic experience, and I was growing up knowing it was there. Yeah. Um, and seeing my sister have things happen to her. Um, I remember one day we were teenagers, and she sat up in the middle of the bed, and she was in a total comatose. She sat up. And I uh, put her hands up. I thought she was maybe sleepwalking. Mm-hmm. And then I saw sparks flying from her fingers. I didn't know what was going on. Um, and so, like, I've seen things like that in my teen years, and then they just go away. Mm-hmm. Um, with no real explanation and me not really wanting to explore it because of the place I was in. Sure. And it was only until I was in my 30s when I felt courageous enough to say, I want to find out what this is all about. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it wasn't until I started hunting with Dan and, and of course, ghost hunters on TV. Sure. I was like, oh, I want to do that, too. I didn't know there was there was groups you could get into mm-hmm. to, to do these things. Then it really started happening for me. So many experiences, so many ghost stories from all over, just everywhere, uh, up until being the owner of the Old Park Hotel. So how so, did so mm-hmm. so in your thirties when you were about thirty six you decided I really want to dive into this I'm in a place where I think I can do this, um, how did that begin I mean how did that journey start as far as investigating I mean how does mm-hmm. how did you go from just being let's I'm really curious I've had these experiences to let's dive in deeper, well and I'm going to tell you tell you everybody has their experiences that make them take their journeys mm-hmm. for me it was that one and then there was this whole. Uh, moving into religion thing. Okay. Because of, of my relationship, you know, with Christ or God, I, I wanted to explore what was there for me. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I can't ignore that there's, there's not something there. Mm-hmm. I mean, how long can you go in your life and not realize that there's something right there all the time and you just haven't taken the time to understand it? So I had a deep desire to understand. I got an interest in demonology. And so I started looking into those things because I wanted to find out what the relationship was and why it was here and what, you know, what makes it tick. Yeah. Uh, When I joined the army in, uh, when I was 18, uh, I had a deep desire to learn to analyze things. And so I think that that, that thing that when I did when I was 18, joining the military, it taught me how to be an intelligence analyst. And ever since then, I've been an analyst. I like to tear things apart and I have this deep desire to want to find out what is on the other side because yeah. of it. So it's like, it's like a tree that grows, a seed that grows and just goes out of control. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes that happens early in life and sometimes that happens later in life. For me, it was a little bit later in life. Yeah. So did you just immediately, did you find a group to join initially? Did you just start kind of looking around for things on your own? Uh, how did that, how did that begin? Goodness gracious. It's sad to say, but I was going through my third divorce. Mm-hmm. Uh, It was just an awful time in my life. I thought I had all my ducks in a row. And of course, I went back to that stress life again. Mm -hmm. So I I was trying to get away from the reality of what I was living. Sure. And and do something that made me happy that I wanted to do for myself. For me, that was exploring the paranormal. Mm -hmm. And I, I I was watching TV. And when I first saw Ghost Hunters, I was like, well, I didn't know that you could do that. Mm-hmm. And so I started looking in San Antonio where I, where I was living at the time for groups to join. And so I got a hold of a guy named Eddie Hill, who was the uh, the founder of After Dark Paranormal. And his best friend was Dan LaFave. Mm-hmm. So they were on the team and that's where I started. Um, and I'm the analyst. So I was made researcher right away. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
and then from then it from there it just we just kept having experiences together at that point yeah um but the religion aspect of it made me want to want to study demonology and made me want to explore you know the relationship between reality and maybe what's out there and so like i never really can satisfy that thirst and i keep creating theories and then trying to prove them or disprove them sure so so yeah. so what were some of those uh, uh first uh experiences that you had you know essentially on your second uh, your, your your go round into this you're you're entering this as wanting to seek these things out it's not just happening at random points in time you are seeking out investigating these sort of things and analyzing these sort of things what were some of those first experiences that you had in that sort of capacity well, I would have to say it began probably at the Black Swan Inn because that was probably one of my first places I ever investigated. And being a brand new investigator uh, in a place that is known to be haunted, I didn't expect much. I didn't really. But then we started looking at the evidence and things started happening to us that made me open my eyes. The first being we walked into the uh, the downstairs dining room and we're taking pictures and, and flipping them back. And then we see... Literally, we see a woman glowing back at us in a reflection. There's no woman in the room. I'm looking at this picture, and it's a woman with jowls, and her eyes are like white in the picture. And that was the first time I'd ever actually seen a picture of an actual ghost. We debunked it. There was nobody else in the room. We just tore it apart. And then on the same investigation, we're seeing a little boy in a picture down at the bottom of the stairs. How do you explain these things when they happen? Mm -hmm. um, I remember going around in a corner and going into the bathroom and standing in there for a while. And all of a sudden I start seeing light anomalies pop up in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So like at that moment, I realized there's more to this than I'm really seeing. I need to dive deeper and really analyze and take a look at what's going on. So like you begin your series of debunking to find out what's really there and what's really not. And so, and then I remember we went on a, a it was, I think it was a wildflower cemetery and, and my God, that place is scary. Um, I remember walking with my group into the cemetery and it would have been my first cemetery. And of course you have, you want to respect, respect everything. It was a public place and we weren't really in the grave area. We were more towards the, the forest line. Mm -hmm. My husband and I and Eddie, we walked into uh, the cemetery, started investigating and I turned my back and someone screams and we all look up and three, at least three of the guys and me, we see a wolf step out of the forest and just stand there and stare at us with, with like, with of course the white eyes at night. Yeah. But the second I look up, this, this wolf vanishes and there was at least three or four of us that saw it. So like, it was my first time ever seeing an animal, uh, a ghostly animal like that. Mm -hmm. So like, it's, it's weird when you look at that because it makes you realize, oh, uh, there's regular ghosts and then there's other kinds of ghosts. And then there's the inhuman ghost or mm -hmm. the inhuman entity. Yeah. So like over all this time, I've had dozens and dozens of experiences that, that have brought me to where I am now, even a demonic possession once, not for me, but uh, going into Del Rio, we called that case the Del Rio devil. We went, we were uh, contacted by a lady who was having trouble with her fiance. And she said that an entity had followed her around all of her life. And recently her fiance was acting strange. And all of a sudden he started screaming out, you know, in the middle of the night with these weird voices. And she wanted to know what we could do to help. Well, we're seven hours away in San Antonio and she wants us to come to Del Rio right now. Couldn't do that. Had to wait three days. So we ended up packing the car and driving all the way there. And we told the rest of our team, it was graveyard shift at the time, hey, we're we're not asking you to come with us on this one because this may be a demonic possession and, and we don't want John Vault. Mm -hmm. And I guess when you enter these things, you really have to be grounded and you have to know what you're doing and you can't pretend. And when you so when you go into the things, we were just trying to protect our friends and our and our loved ones. When we got there, we set up and we introduced ourselves and got everything hooked up and we said, okay, we don't know what to expect. We interviewed them. We asked them what the religion was because you know, when you approach these things, you always want to ask and respect other people's religions or their belief systems because you're not there to preach to them. Sure. You're there, you're there to help them find validation so they can get help or 
or, or go past that um, and, and direct them into the right places where they can get help. Um, so we went in there and I said, I got an idea. Let's, because people that are, have possession, they tend to uh, black out and they don't remember a lot of things. Mm-hmm. It's one of the symptoms. So what we did was we created a sign for him. We said, and I don't even remember his name. I think it was Chris or Charlie. I don't even remember his name. We asked him and said, okay, what we're going to do is give you a sign and you have to tell us the sign so we know it's you. That way we can distinguish between you and a demonic entity if there is one. Um, so what we did was we set up a sign and then we started our prayers, you know, the St. Michael's prayer. And we had our, our holy water and our Bible and all that stuff there. But basically what we did was we, we coaxed it out and we got two hours of videotape with this guy screaming and just totally wigging out. His eyes were dilated. He was speaking in voices we did not recognize. Uh, they tend to have attitudes and, and, and they're very strong. But it's not the screaming, uh, vomiting, pee stuff you see on TV. It's it's quite different. Uh, their voices do change. Their their physical appearance does slightly change. Their eyes do dilate. Um, their their body does become contorted at some points. They're stronger than normal, and then they can't remember most of it. So like we we managed to get get the demon to come forward, and as soon as we had it on tape, we knew it was time to stop because. Our job isn't to exercise demons. It's to get validation and help for these people so somebody else can do it. Because sometimes exorcisms take, you know, forever, sure. two, three months, sometimes years. So that's the reason why paranormal investigators don't do that stuff. Yeah, uh, It's not that we can't or don't want to. It's just that we don't have the time. We don't have the resources. And then that's not what we're there to do. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, we just had multiple experiences like that all throughout our our, our careers as, as ghost hunters. So when, um, you're, when you're there and, and you you get this call from someone saying, I, I think my fiance may be possessed. There may be something going on here. You're going in there, uh, you know, knowing that that this could be dangerous. You're, you're telling your team members, look, I don't want all you coming. This is going to be a very small group. What do you have going through your mind as you're in that car ride driving down there that makes you feel safe, qualified, um, uh, or, or, you know, able to assist in something like that? I mean, cause that's a pretty serious thing. Right. It's scary. Just sitting there thinking about it. Yeah. The, the first thing you think of is even though I'm a Christian and I feel really grounded, like you still have that little thing in the back of your head this is what are you doing are you crazy Mm -hmm. um and getting in the car i'm thinking the whole time okay do do i feel grounded right now am i prepared to go in like this um i have my partner with me is he grounded that's what i was more afraid of was is my partner ground is dan grounded Mm -hmm. is is he going to be able to handle this where does he really stand with god and all those things and so we're driving seven hours we're freaking out because we're hearing all the screaming on the phone and the tape that we recorded, and it 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 was a it was a unnerving experience to hear that so far away. What we heard, it was not a human voice. It was not, it was not normal. And anybody that's listening to that could tell, you know, even a non-experienced person that it's not in the paranormal. So we're driving down, and I'm I'm making sure. Okay, do I have my Bible? Do we know the Saint Michael's Prayer pretty well enough, you know, to bring it out and and is our equipment ready? And, and, and also emotionally, are we ready to deal with something we've never dealt with before? Yeah. Cause eventually in this community, you have to learn how to help people in other ways besides just ghost hunting and collecting information. You've got to figure out how do I help this person and how do I guide them so that they can have some peace. So we're freaking out all the way there. I mean, all the way there, that's all we could talk about. And we couldn't wait to get there fast enough because we knew this lady needed help. She was desperate. Um, it, it was it was uh, so horrifying to hear that voice and not being able to do anything about it. What is your goal as you're you're heading there? I mean, what what is is the expectation of you from your client, and mm-hmm. and what is your goal going there to try and assist in this as you're driving down there? What's going through your mind at the end of the day? What do you want to do to help that person? Sure. Well, after you diagnose this case, um, 
we were working with a priest. Um, I can't remember his name, uh, Father Gonzalez. He was the one that was the apprentice to the assistant of the original case for, uh, what was that Anthony Hopkins movie that, that was out? I can't remember the name of it. Are you talking uh, about The Exorcist? No, not The Exorcist. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Anthony Hopkins was uh, trying to uh, show the other priest, um, you know, about what demonic possession really was. Uh, and the right. It was the right. The right. The right. Okay. Yep. The okay. right. Yep. So the actual priest that did the right, mm-hmm. he had an assistant. Okay. And that assistant had an apprentice, and that's the father we were talking to on the phone. Okay. And he got in on the case because this family was Catholic, and we wanted to, you know, respect and honor. Uh, their their wishes mm-hmm. so we got involved with the priest to help help them get evidence because they wanted to do an exorcist but they had of course the you know the catholic church has to have evidence before they can do a full right exorcist sure or exorcism so our job when we got there was to get the evidence and we know how we know how to get the evidence and bring it out if there is a demonic possession there we know how to do it so our goal was to get it verified and on tape and recorded so that we could forward it to the right people so that they could deal with it. So you're, you're so, there, to, you, you are not going there with the intent of you're going to get this demon out. You're going there of, I'm going to get what, what they need then for the, the church then to take over and do their part. Cause without it, that's, that's exactly right. They're kind yeah. of dead in the water. Is that, did, did, did your client understand that uh, going in? Yes. Okay. Yes. We, we talked with the client way ahead of time went through the whole process. We, we were very methodical when we, when we did do our investigations, mm-hmm. we'd always do a pre, uh, pre interview. We would decide whether or not it warranted even, a, even an investigation. Sure. And, and then after we gathered the information, we could set up a time to go talk with them and look around. Uh, and then we would do a preliminary report. Okay. What's the activity here? How often does it occur? Uh, what's happening, document it all, mm-hmm. find out if there was anything before that in the house, uh, if you can, or on the land, mm-hmm. uh, find out if they have any personal connections. And also one thing we always ask, we always ask if they were, we were trying to figure out if they were cuckoo or not, yeah. because in, in this field, uh, you know, you do have some nuts in it. Oh, sure. And you, as an investigator, have to figure out: okay, is this guy a nut or is he not a nut? Well, I mean, and, so, and, and how? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, getting a psychiatric evaluation and mm-hmm. and having someone come in and see if there is any sort of uh, mental illness going on. I mean, that's that's obviously number one. Um, yes, and, and, and I mean, that's the hardest thing to do, too. Sure, I mean, I mean, because again, you're going to have to either, unless you're sitting there with the psych, the psychiatrist or psychologist that's looking at them, you're still going to be taking them at their word that they either had this evaluation done or not. That's right. So That's exactly right. I mean, so sometimes I could imagine someone could say, yes, I've been evaluated when in fact, no, they haven't or, or not done by a qualified individual. I mean, so, exactly. so, so how how do you, um, and, and I want to go back to the this possession story, but I want to ask about mm-hmm. that since we're on it. I mean, how do you truly, uh, what what works for you and, and, mm-hmm. and your team to, to get a, a sufficient answer to that question of whether someone is suffering from some sort of mental illness uh, versus there's something paranormal going on here? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, since Dan was in the Air Force and I was in the Army, uh, I, I was an analyst. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, we're not mental health uh, professionals. Sure. We, we don't have the right to go in and evaluate someone and tell them whether they're psychologically no. crazy or not. But what we do do is we ask a series of questions that will help us get to the root of why they're having the issues. Like, for instance, what is your background? Where do you come from? Have you had any traumatic experiences in your life? One guy was a Vietnam vet. So that was in the back of our head when we were asking him questions. Mm -hmm. We thought he may have PTSD. Sure. So that might be tied to it. So we can't diagnose, but what we do do is ask a series of questions to help us eliminate and uh, come up with possibilities of other possible reasons why they may be experiencing these things. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we mainly just document it. And then once we've collected our evidence, we go back and evaluate and say, well, he did have this and this. And we try to tie it together or not tie it together, depending on what's going on. Mm-hmm. So really, that has been a good um, rule of thumb to follow when we did when, when, I, when we did have our team together. Mm-hmm. When we had our team together, that was a good rule of, of thumb to follow on any investigation was to make sure that we asked all the right questions. 
uh, did our homework, provided all the, you know, the information. So, and then you can make an evaluation. Okay. Which way do we need to go here? Yeah. Do we need to go in and ask, uh, say some prayers and get it on tape? Or do we need to call the psychic in who knows what they're doing to help out with the situation? Um, and so like then in, in the field, you know, there's skeptics and then there's going to be people that are legit. So you also have to be able to separate that from what you do. That wraps up the first part of our conversation with Connie in part two. What does one do when they're dealing with a possession and have to wait for the church to come and help? What can be done to help someone deal with the potential dangers of a possession? How did Connie and her husband Dan become owners of the haunted Old Park Hotel in Ballinger, Texas? And what kind of spirits haunt the halls of the Old Park Hotel? Those questions and more in part two. Until next time for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.